There is one more thing I should mention about this film. Granted, the animation is like a hundred times better than Titanic The Legend Goes On, but the characters are so incredibly wooden that you'd think you were looking at a puppet show. I mean, seriously, it's like watching Mannequins Act. Hey, over here, my boy! I'll take a copy! What? Surely you're not thinking of changing the rules, are you? Oh, no, the rules are fine just the way they are. Thank one you. for you and one for Ronnie. Good, huh? We'll come back and make our report as agreed, but there's one thing you have to do in exchange. Get out. I'm sure Father would never have given him the whaling rights. We have to speak with him. Come on. They just didn't care. Anyway. On board the Titanic, Maltravers and Jeffrey talk about some evil plan to gain rights for his company to do whaling by marrying Elizabeth, since her father owns all the seas where the whales are. Whoa. If I didn't know any better, I'd say I was watching an episode of Captain Planet. Pray let me in on the joke. I like a laugh as well as the next man. Hey, uh, nothing, boss. Nothing whatsoever. I was, um, uh, simply admiring the masterful way in which you're carrying out this operation. Oh, and one other thing, Jeffries. When I want to hear your opinions, I'll ask for them. Is that quite clear? Wait, what? You did ask! So then we see a shot of the impressive CGI Titanic while listening to the film's main theme song. This CGI is so horrible that you'd think you were looking at a damn screensaver. And on a side note, the film's theme song is so overplayed that you'd want to blow out your eardrums with a revolver halfway through the film. On top of that, it also sounds like it has strains of The Little Mermaid and E.T. the Extraterrestrial woven into it. Oh, and by the way, once again smoke is coming out of the fourth funnel, and there are no people in sight! Oh wait, there they are. Three very flat paper cut out people. Captain Smith, it seems, has to attend dinner that evening and... Wait, that's not Captain Smith. And neither are those people the Titanic's crew members. Gee, Mondo TV Studios really paid attention to historical accuracy, didn't they? At dinner, Elizabeth is angered when her family proposes that she marry Mal Travers aboard the ship and not caring about how she feels about it. Which is ironic because they do not care for the fact that her hair is let out freely at a fancy dinner and she's wearing a very low-cut dress that totally doesn't look like what Rose wore from the James Cameron movie. Incredible isn't the right word. What would be incredible would be if someone were to ask my opinion on a matter that concerns me so closely. Elizabeth, remember what time period you were in? Women did not have opinions in 1912. The mice notice this, and Ronnie makes what is undoubtedly the weirdest observation of any animated character in history. I hate to be a spoil sport, but I would like to draw to your attention the fact that she's a woman and you're a mouse. <laughs> well, there's one thing I'm not, and that's a racist. Well, there's one thing I'm not, and that's a racist. Okay, then. I'm not sure if I can fully comprehend just how weird that statement is. <laughs> so, one of the lessons this film teaches kids is that you are a racist if you do not think that a mouse and a human lady could become a couple? Uh, bestiality, Italy? Seriously? That's what you aim to teach the youth? Poor Elizabeth runs out on the deck to cry, as a sad song plays in the background. This song is perhaps the only cool thing about this entire movie. Also, is it just me, or does this scene look like when Rose is about to jump off the stern of the Titanic after a similar occurrence? They just reversed it and set it at the bow instead. More plagiarism, folks, and they just didn't care. This would be a nice moment with some character development for her as she ponders her future, but then dolphins that come out of nowhere arrive on the scene. And it's weird because these dolphins look more like orcas. And then, the movie goes batshit insane. If you try, Elizabeth. Very well, Elizabeth. Now I'll explain. 
You can understand us thanks to a net of magic moonbeams that caught your tears as they fell into the water. We added a little magic of our own, and voila! The spell was cast. <laughs> magic moonbeams? Magic moonbeams? Are you freaking kidding me? And she just accepts it? She accepts that the dolphins can suddenly jump over 60 feet high and hover by flapping their little fins? I mean, if I were her, I'd be freaking the frig out and screaming that I'd become the 1912 version of Dr. Doolittle. But her biggest reaction is, oh, and I can understand you. Ladies and gentlemen, all credibility is now completely gone and is now replaced with insanity. Credibility that was slow, that was slowly draining away at a nice, slow pace. However, with flipper talking and hovering, not to mention the fact that he looks like Shamu, this movie have gone completely bonkers. So the dolphins explained to her that her tears were hit by magical moonbeams, and then somehow they added their own magic, which now allows her to understand dolphin and animal talk. Okay, so let me get this straight. If I cry near a body of water and a moonbeam hits my tears as it falls, then I should be able to talk to animals? Hmm, I wonder... How do you do, Howie? Can you understand me? You can wish hmm? for a star if you try. Okay, screw that. Anyway, they ask her to stop crying because they joke her tears will drown them. Only now you really must stop crying, my dear. Yes, please, or you'll drown us. <laughs> <laughs> Joking about drowning in a Titanic movie, oh, what a laugh! Ah! The dolphins then tell her about how her fiancé's company is whaling whales into extinction. And talking of which, Maltravers is talking to Elizabeth's father about getting the rights to whale in his seas. The father is reluctant and tells him to ask him later when the marriage happens. Maltravers is angry at this and tells Jeffrey to keep an eye on Elizabeth while he works on getting his whaling rights. Also, he mentions that if he can't get his way, he wants to use something to do just that. Hmm, I wonder what it could be. Well, Jeffrey goes outside and uses a magic whistle to contact a talking shark named Mr. Ice that works for Maltravers, to be ready when he is needed. Wait, 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 wait. Maltravers suddenly has a gang of criminal talking sharks at his disposal? You've gotta be kidding me. Oh, and one more thing. I forgot to question this, but how on earth did the dolphins know about Maltravers' evil plan to expand his whaling company? I mean, he had just sent Jeffrey to deliver the message before dinner. Did the dolphins somehow use their magic, a net of moonbeams or whatever, to accept the radio signal? Furthermore, at no point does this movie ever explain how Maltravers got the said whistle or how he and Jeffrey got the ability to talk to sharks. I mean, did they cry off the bow, off, off the bow, off a, off a whaling ship, and then suddenly magic moonbeams strike them? I mean, seriously, people. Ugh. Thank you, Mondo TV Studios, for yet another gaping plot hole. The next day, Elizabeth is still upset and pondering things over, so Connors and Ronnie go to comfort her. When she reaches her cabin, whose door breaks all the rules of perspective, Connors and Ronnie tell her that she doesn't have to put up with her stepmother forcing her to marry Maltravers, and that she should stand up to her. Elizabeth instantly feels better and declares she doesn't have to marry him. She'll stand up to her stepmother and stop the evil whaling plan as well, with the help of her mice friends, because mice, you know, are very helpful. Ever see Cinderella? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. More plagiarism? So Connors and Ronnie spy on Elizabeth's stepmother and Maltravers, and learn that they are working with each other to get the whaling rights. No, I never would have guessed. And by the way, it is never explained why Duke Camden's wife and her sister are in cahoots with Maltravers. That's one more plot hole for us audiences. The mice relay the info back to Elizabeth, and she goes to her father about it. She tells him that she refuses to marry the man, 
and her dad understands. He doesn't want her to be unhappy. My one and only plan, dear girl, is to see you as happy as possible. And I would never dream of forcing you to do something you don't want to. But then that raises the question of why the hell did he force her to get engaged with the guy before if it didn't make her happy then? Elizabeth, behave yourself. Must I remind you that Everard Merle Travers has asked for your hand? And that your stepmother and I both consider it an excellent match. I'd rather die than marry that horrifying, disgusting, old serpent. What do you mean, old? He's barely 40. Old indeed. Huh? Very well, Daddy. He's a middle-aged serpent then. Elizabeth, don't be impertinent. You have a position to keep up. Your stepmother and I simply want what's best for our little girl. Try to be reasonable. He clearly knew she wasn't happy with the arrangements, so why all of a sudden is he respecting her wishes? Damn it! Why doesn't this make sense? Yet another plot hole. <laughs> Later, Smiley the dog and the mice run into each other. Smiley is trying to locate Elizabeth for his glove fetishist of a master, Juan, because apparently after just ten seconds of glimpsing her, he's fallen head over heels in love. They inform Smiley of the situation, who in turn tells them about his own thing with his master. They then work out a plan to bring Juan and Elizabeth together the next day. One of their plans, to distract Maltravers and the wicked stepmother, is to send him flying perpendicularly down the hall, instead of right into the wall behind him, on a cart that wasn't even there a second ago, and into the laundry room via a soccer ball the size of a ping pong ball that Ronnie kicks into him. Okay, so here are two more lessons this film teaches us. One, a tiny soccer ball kicked by a mouse can launch a full-grown man off the ground. Two, Titanic's laundry room was located at the end of the first-class cabin corridor instead of down below by the steerage. Are you freaking serious, Mondo TV Studios?